Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video of myself, Marta. Hope you guys are having a good Friday and that the weather is better for you than it is for me at the moment. Anyway, we have a very console focused video for you today with a lot of Sony news, but we do have some Microsoft stuff later on in the video. But we're going to start off with our PlayStation 5 news, the first of which is some very interesting comments from the Sony CEO, Kenichiro Yoshida. So he discussed various things as he spoke about their plans in a speech at Sony's corporate strategy meetings related to their year-end earnings reports. And in that speech, he said a lot of things, obviously. First of all, he said that they are going to be heavily investing in first-party games for PlayStation 5, unsurprisingly. But he also touched on how they're not just going to be focusing on the PlayStation 5 for their gaming future. So what does this actually mean? Well, Yoshida said that users will be able to take games purchased via disc or via the network and play them anytime, anywhere. So we're talking about things like Remote Play, which uses a PS4 console in your home as a server that streams to other devices, and of course, PlayStation Now, a cloud gaming service that lets you play games and stream them to your PlayStation 4. Now, a long time ago, I can't actually remember how long ago off the top of my head, I did have a look at PlayStation Now, and the latency issues were definitely enough to put me off using the service, but that was a long time ago. It is very possible it has improved since then. I would love to hear your thoughts on the state of PlayStation Now, if you have used it in the last year or so, shall we say. Now, unsurprisingly, due to the latency issues, PlayStation Now has been slow to take off, but Yoshida also said that they've reached a record of 2.2 million subscribers in the most recent quarter compared to a million a year ago. Now, obviously, this probably has been helped along a little bit by the fact that everyone's, you know, at home at the moment, or a lot of people are at home at the moment, but we undoubtedly will see people continue the subscription uh, once things return to some sort of normality. And he himself said, quote, over the last five years, we have verified that gamers do see value in the service and we have accumulated technology and patents to minimize latency. And he also went on to say that we are going to be seeing more games, including uh, AAA titles added to the service and is going to make it accessible via 5G. Interestingly enough, for this end, Sony has allied itself with Microsoft on the streaming tech so they can make use of Microsoft's massive investment in data centers and, of course, their Azure cloud services. Now, they are continuing, of course, to invest in mobile games, obviously. So, while well, obviously the PlayStation 5 is going to be their main focus in the gaming sector, they aren't just putting all of their eggs in one basket. But I'd say it's safe to say that most of their eggs in the, are in the PS5 basket. But we have lots of patents for the console today, the first of which is for the PlayStation VR. Now, I will say this patent was discovered a little while ago, but I completely missed it, and I find this so interesting, I just wanted to discuss it. Basically, it's about a set of gloves, a VR glove with haptic feedback, where you could potentially touch an in-game item and, and, and feel you know, as if you actually have it in your hand. Now, the patent is for a glove, or gloves, I should say, so he does also mention that the tech could also be used for other items of clothing, like, quote, a hat, footwear, pants, or a shirt. They are considering a variety of systems to make haptic feedback work, such as heating, cooling, compressed gas and liquid, as well as a motor, and these would work alongside PSVR to give you the right kinds of feedback at the right time. And further according to the patent, you will be able to feel the texture and shape of a, of a virtual object, the pressure you're placing on it, movement from the item, and how close it is to another object. So, apparently it's going to go even further than just being able to feel like I'm holding a small box that has something, you know, it has a weight to it, but it's not huge, like, I don't know, an old watch, just for example, so you can feel the weight of it in your hand, it, it's even going beyond that. It could also be able to provide touch feedback when things happen to your character, including being held, moved, t uh, crushed, squeezed, and stuff like that. That does sound kind of scary, to be honest. Like, imagine if you could feel like when your character gets shot in the chest or something like that, and it feels like someone punched you in the chest. Like, 
I feel like there is a point where you start to take immersion too far, but um, obviously this is just a patent. We're not going to see haptic feedback VR suits ready to purchase in Best Buy tomorrow. This is obviously just a patent. We may or may not see something actually come out of it. And as I said, we've got loads of patents today. It's Patent City today, I'm telling you. This one is for the Dual Sense controller, and I just want to thank Eddie on Twitter for DMing us this. Thank you very much to him. If you do find anything like this, guys, do feel free to DM us, email us, send a carrier pigeon our way. But either way, let's discuss this second patent now. Now, as I said, this was DM'd to us by Eddie, but was initially tweeted by Zuby Wups. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, you can find their tweet linked in the description below this video. So you can find the patent linked below. It is not in English, so I've had to Google Translate it, so obviously do take everything here with a pinch of mistranslation salt. But essentially what it is for is for dual sense internals. And the patent itself reads, quote, Many input devices used for game operations have a plurality of operation members, such as an operation stick, a push button, cross key, direction key, and a trigger, trigger butter, button. Excuse me. Patent document one discloses an input device having such an operation member and having a voice input function. The input device has a microphone array composed of a plurality of microphones. In patent document one, adaptive beam forming processing is executed for a user's uttered voice by using voice data obtained from a plurality of microphones. And the patent goes on to later describe as two microphones at least. It says, quote, it has a front microphone lo located rearward of the center of the central portion and a second microphone arranged inside the central portion. And the patent basically goes on to describe how it's going to reduce the amount that you're going to be blocking uh, these mics when you actually just hold the controller in your hands. But a lot of the focus of the patent is just on the internals of the controller. You can see various pictures that I've been showing on screen and probably I'm continuing to show. I'm not going to go into detail of the whole patent because frankly I'll be here until Christmas. Not even this Christmas but next Christmas because there is just that much information. But essentially it's just detailing the haptic triggers, mic jack and further details of the controller. So you can find that linked below if you want to give it a read. It is obviously a bit of a lengthy one but very very interesting nonetheless and we have one more patent to get through for today which is regarding a cooling system for the development kit so this was discovered by the folks over at let's go digital you can of course find their article linked in the description below this video and you may recall that they were the ones that unearthed those patents that gave us an inkling of what the dev kit actually looks like and probably what we'll see so at least some influence on the final product so just to be super clear before i go into this this patent is for the dev kit cooling system so this doesn't necessarily mean that we won't see it in the final product but i'm just saying that this is for the dev kit so it doesn't necessarily mean we will see it in the final product as well however we do have a lengthy description for how the cooling system actually works and it says, quote, an electronic device has a plurality of cooling fans for supplying air to the heat sink. The plurality of cooling fans create air flows that pass through the heat sink from a first side of the heat sink toward a second side of the heat sink. The heat sink is disposed oblique to the left right direction and the front rear direction of the electronic device. An exterior member has an intake port formed along, alongside the first side of the heat sink and oblique to the front rear direction and the left right direction. A heat sink is disposed on a microprocessor mounted on a circuit board. A cooling fan is disposed upstream of the heat sink and a pass by unit is disposed downstream of the heat sink. Hairs air sent out from the cooling fan passes through the heatsink, passes through the power supply unit and is discharged to the outside. I know that's a lot of words and I just feel like I just speed a lot of word salad but that is what it said. I feel like it's clearer if you look at the image you can kind of get a feel for how the airflow of the system actually works. And again this is for the development kit. 
we may or may not see this in the final product. Now, we'll just say the main reason we're covering this is because Paul is going to be discussing this and a few other things for the PlayStation 5 that we've been told in a upcoming video, which is going to be out soon, hopefully in the next few days, but I'm not promising. Uh, he does have his hands full with a lot of projects right now, but he, he is working on it as we speak. So you can expect that from him in the next few days. Anyway, we're going to move on now to yet more rumours about Bloodborne on PC. Now, obviously, we've had a lot of chat around the possibility of Bloodborne coming to PC over the last couple of weeks. The rumours originated from 4chan, I believe, off the top of my head. And now they have resurfaced with a bit more of a worthy, or trustworthy source, sorry, should I say. So, the first hint came from Wario64 over on Twitter, and he basically said, quote, you can play Bloodborne on PC with PS Now, or wait a little longer. And then, a Twitter user by the name of Slothmom said, quote, for those just joining me, yes, Bloodborne will be coming to the PC. I've confirmed it by a very trusted source, and I have a lot of faith in the company who's doing the port. You won't be disappointed. It genuinely is happening. Also, on top of all of that, the resetter mo uh, moder moderator, I can't speak today, sorry guys, Jaw Moncher, also claims that the rumour is real and that we will be seeing a Bloodborne coming to the PC. I just really, really hope this is true, guys. <laughs> I really do. I would be so happy if Bloodborne came to PC. Now, I know that guy made a mod to run it at 60 FPS, but that is not an easy thing to use. You have to use it on a PS4 Pro, and you have to use it on a modded PS4 Pro. Good luck finding a PS4 Pro that you can mod, guys, is what I'm going to say. So, an actual proper PC version that isn't on PS now would be fantastic. You know, playing the game at 60 or unlocked frame rates, you know, proper graphics options, just... Mmm, yes please. Just, just please. Is all I say for... Take my money from software again because I have Bloodborne already but I'll happily buy it again to play it again at a proper frame rate because it's still a great game don't get me wrong but you know it would be nice not to have those issues hampering it is what I will say now obviously we've had some rumors about you know Horizon Zero Dawn and that sort of thing coming to PC which obviously they were true because it is now available to purchase on Steam so does this mean that we will see more games coming to the PC from Sony that were previously exclusive. Well, we see it come a little faster as well, because obviously Bloodborne's been out <laughs> a little while, let's just say that. So I do wonder if we will see a bit of a shorter time frame between the game launching exclusively for PS4 slash PS5 or whatever, and then coming out on the PC. I hope so. I feel like a year is not an unreasonable time, but whether or not Sony would do that... I don't know, but if this is true, and I'm fairly confident that it, there's a good chance it will be, but again, this is just a rumour, please do not take this as confirmed, but if this is true, I feel like this is definitely a sign from Sony that shows they are definitely willing to invest more in the PC. You know, if Bloodborne comes to PC, then... All bets are off <laughs> for the PS4 exclusives and, of course, future PS5 exclusives. I would love to see more of attention paid from Sony to the PC, even if it is like a couple of years later we see it come to PC. That's fine. I'm happy with that. But of course, we'll have to wait and see. We probably would have found out at the Sony event where we finally were going to see the PS5 games, but obviously that was postponed, as we've already discussed. But that is us done for the PlayStation segment of this video. We have a couple of Xbox related things to round off the video. The first of which is regarding xCloud and Game Pass. So this once again was discovered by a user on the Reset Era forums, a user by the name of 12danny123, and they discovered a Samsung page which was dedicated to Samsung Access for TV. You can find it linked below, it is still up, information that was still there is still there. And basically it includes reference to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. And it says, quote, with Samsung Access, you get your choice of a streaming or gaming service up to $120 in value, included at no additional cost. Choose from Showtime, 
Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, YouTube Premium, YouTube TV, YouTube Music, and Sling TV. So it isn't outside the realms of possibility that we'll also see things such as Project X Cloud come to Samsung TVs, but for the moment at least, Samsung Access does include, if you so choose, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. So for our final topic of today, it is going to be on Xbox and Japan. So basically what this comes down to with this one is that Microsoft are making a concerted effort to do much better in Japan this time around than they did with the Xbox One. And this was basically confirmed by Microsoft in a statement supplied to Famitsu that they will be seeing the Xbox Series X launching in Japan during the holiday season. Now this is very different to the previous generation because it arrived almost a year late in Japan compared to the rest of the world. And four titles have been confirmed for release in Japan. Halo Infinite, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Scarlet Nexus and Bright Memory Infinite. And the launch in Japan could occur at the same time as the Western regions. And Phil Spencer has previously said quite recently that they felt that their market position in Japan for the last generation was not acceptable and pledged to do a quote much better job with the Series X launch in the region. Now this is unsurprising that they're doing this given how poorly the Xbox One actually did in Japan. According to the market research company IDC, the Xbox One made just 0.3% of their global sales in the country. And according to Famitsu's latest annual sales report for 2018, they're claiming that the console sold only 15,300, sorry, 339 units during the entire year, compared to, oh, just 1.7 million for the PS4 and 3.5 million for the Switch. So it's not unfair to say that the console's performance in Japan was abysmal, because it was, let's be real. 15,000 versus 1.7 million compared and 3.5 million for the Switch. So I'm not really surprised to see Microsoft recognising that they need to make a much better and much bigger push to really claim a portion of the gaming market in Japan. I don't know if they will, to be honest. I mean, the fact that the Switch has sold so much more than the PS4 even tells you a lot about the sort of consoles that are popular in the country. They're very big on mobile gaming, you know, games that you can kind of play you know, on your way to work, on your lunch break, stuff like that. So I don't know if we will see it be as popular as the Switch, but I don't know if that's what Microsoft are aiming for here. I think they're just aiming for better. And to be fair, even if they sold... I don't know, 500,000 units in the entire year. That would be a huge improvement over what we previously saw. And obviously launching at the same time as it did in the West would be a huge, huge help because, you know, the, the Japanese gamers are not going to just wait around for the Xbox to come out. They're just going to go with the Switch or PS5 or, or whatever. So, going to be interesting to see how this strategy pans out for Microsoft, but that is me done for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Your support does mean a huge deal to both myself and Paul, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.